guess I'll just jump right into it. You know, from our perspective, obviously, uh, UGA, uh, their, their sort of history of close calls, uh, particularly against Alabama, um, is what adds a lot of resonance to this game. You know, can you talk about, I guess, that and, and how, uh, especially within the context of, you know, Georgia football fans and this long running sort of almost obsession now with, with winning a national title? Yeah, so I think it's one of those really interesting aspects of just, I think as a whole, this interest in a national champion. Um, and just to go, you know, a little, little way far back, um, I always find it really interesting with the history of college football, how, you know, the first 40, 50 years, it really wasn't a huge interest in who was the national champion. It was really rather who was the best in their region or area. And that's really, you know, you look at that and that's kind of because they, you know, the travel, the travel back then just wasn't the same. Uh, it really wasn't until like 1926 when an uh, economics professor from Illinois, uh, Frank Dickinson, really created that first mathematical formula uh, to determine who was, the, who was the next national champion. And uh, Newt Rockney liked it so much, he had to go back in, you know, 24 and 25. And in 24, then uh, Notre Dame was named a national champion. But just, you know, in respect to the interest of Georgia, I just find it a really interesting aspect because how close it's been these last few years. I was, you know, just looking back at, of course, uh, the 2018 game, but just in general, how, how close they've come is uh, something I find interesting. And I think a little bit exciting, I'm sure as a Georgia fan, a little excruciating at times. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, it's interesting. You talk about the, um, the history of how it was more regionalized. And obviously there was a time when the, from the Georgia perspective, winning just the SEC title amounted to that, that was kind of the Holy grail for a little while there. And then they've had enough sustained, uh, sustained success for the last, you know, 10, 15 years that it's, it's shifted to that, that national title. Um, you know, how have, how have you observed that? And especially with the College Football Hall of Fame there being in Atlanta, you know, how have you observed, uh, I guess, that shifting over time? Yeah, it's the, it's the shifting. And I think when great teams are starting to build towards that national prominence, I think it's the logical next step. Uh, people forget as great as Alabama's been these last, this last decade or two, uh, it wasn't always the case. Uh, it's a lot of times just being, I think people start out just being happy to be invited for, you know, to the game or to the bowl games, you know, making the SEC championship, potentially winning it. And so I think it's the natural progression of a team like Georgia to really not settle on just winning or, you know, losing the SEC championship, but having the opportunity, especially with the college football playoff to, uh, te you know, test their, the skills of guests, uh, the best in the country, if you will. That, that's another interesting thing that you bring up um, that Alabama, you know, obviously they, they were not always the Alabama. We know them now to be, uh, you know, when, when did that, I guess, sort of generals, I mean, you know, you can use Alabama as kind of a marker there, but when did that sort of general shift in the power from like those sort of historical, Midwestern, you know, you think of like your Notre Dames and your Ohio States and your Michigans from from earlier on. What, you know, how did that shift happen to the South, really? That's a that's a really in interesting question. As you mentioned, you know, before early in the history of college football, the South there wasn't a whole lot going on uh, as far as football. They were kind of the underdogs. People didn't really take them serious. Of course, 1917, retroactively, Georgia Tech became national champions. But I, it's really interesting because one of the kind of turning points is some, a school that a lot of people don't think of, and that's Center College uh, in D Danbury, Kentucky. Or excuse me, Danville, Kentucky, uh, the Prang uh, Colonels, and how they played the first real national schedule, uh, you know, early in the 1920s. And that kind of was the uh, – the, uh, the welcome party for Southern football. 
And you really start to see that over the years, they start to become more and more uh, competitive. But uh, I think the, the incorporation of the SEC championship in 1992 and having that championship game and that kind of becoming the gold standard for championship games now, every conference has one. I think that was really one of those moments and times where you start to see more and more Southern schools start to really shift away from maybe more of the Midwest and, uh, you know, Western schools. But uh, that's just one thing I observed. And of course, with a coach like coach Nick Saban, his, uh, his coaching tree has become uh, nothing short of remarkable at this point. Now um, with, with this national championship coming up Monday's game, um, obviously it's the second time Georgia and Alabama have played in that game in the last uh, five years or whatever it is. Uh, you know, how does that add to the significance of it? I guess it seems like it's a little more rare these days to have those kinds of rematches that you see or, or two teams that are at that level together for so long. Um, you know, how does that compare to earlier eras, I guess? Correct. It's really interesting because I think it's almost a shift back to the older eras where you had teams that would either compete for that multiple national championships in a row or really start to create, I, I won't go as far as to say dynasties, but start to retain the same players. And I think it's interesting with uh, more, more and more teams in recent years, it's one or two, a handful of players that really set the mark. I always think of LSU and Joe Burrow and that remarkable run. But it, I think it's a lot to do with coaching, a lot to do with, you know, retaining players as much as they can, of course. Um, and so I think that's just, in, it's an interesting aspect, especially, as I mentioned, with the coaching, uh, especially. I think you have those coaches that stick around uh, longer than a lot of uh, other coaches, as we see, uh, you know, this offseason is, well, offseason for some has been really interesting to see where, you know, coaches and even players now at the transfer portal are moving to to try to try to get in that best position to, of course, win a title. Yeah. And now, you know, I don't want to ask you to sort of historically rank or anything like that. But when you think of Georgia's place in this era, you know, and especially in particular Kirby Smart's place in this era, do they almost need that national championship to cement themselves as one of those power programs from the last 10 years? Or, or, you know, is, or if they don't win it, will they just be remembered as this, this kind of, you know, Buffalo Bills-esque sort of team from, from this time? I, I would say, do they need it? No. But would it help? Of course. I think it would be one of those interesting eras, as you mentioned, with a team like Buffalo that seems to be, you know, the 90s Buffalo, four straight Super Bowls, seem to always be knocking at that door, but quite not being able to get in. And I, I wouldn't say it lessens their legacy by any, by, any, by any stretch of the imagination, but I definitely think it helps embody what these last few years of Georgia football really have been because people forget, even if you're maybe not in in the title hunt, for example, still having really good records multiple years in a row is something that is impressive. But as you mentioned, and as we talked about earlier, uh, with just winning the SEC championship or being part of that is maybe not quite enough anymore for, of course, the Georgia team, but of course, also the Georgia fans. Yeah. And, um, you know, is there anything else uh, that, I, that I haven't asked you about that you find, you know, sort of interesting about this game or, or its hor historical context um, coming up? I think one of the biggest things is you look at, of course, as we know, Alabama has won the last seven, seven matchups. But it's an old saying on, you know, any given Saturday, any given Sunday, and in this case, on any given Monday, I think two teams that have r risen consistently to such a national prominence um, I'm excited for this game to kind of see what, what happens. These teams have played each other enough, uh, some close games, some closer than or less close than others, but it's just one of those areas I'm really excited for, uh, especially since this is one of the first uh, kind of CFP games that is a little more in the, uh, the Northern territory to just kind of show what, what Southern football is all about. And me being, being from the Midwest, that was something I think I learned quickly uh, moving down to Georgia about uh, kind of the impact of college football uh, compared to where I come from. 
now. And actually, just one last thing that popped into mind while you were talking there. Um, obviously, yeah, like you mentioned, Alabama has won so many of these matchups and the, the most recent SEC championship game turned into quite a bit of a dud, which, you know, that one of the questions is, will it be a little bit closer or whatever? But has there ever been an, an instance where two teams played each other so, you know, had a rematch so soon after they had played each other? In, a, in another big game and then and then in the national title game? Uh, that's an excellent question. I don't have any someone who comes uh, directly to mind, but I'm sure you can think of a lot of, you know, the SEC, ACC teams. Um, of course, it's always uh, I, more recently at a point to Alabama and Clemson seem to be uh, since the CFP era, which is really kind of more, I think the more recent era, of course, of these teams being in the uh, in the CFP, and I mean, even conferences, you look at the ACC and uh, the SEC seems to be sending teams almost, well, yearly to the CFP. So that's, I think, one of those interesting eras, current eras we're in, if you will. All right. Um, well, yeah, any, and then I guess just, just, again, any last sort of thing that, that's on your mind or you're looking forward to with this game? Uh, one of the things I'm really excited for here at the College Football Hall of Fame is our ability to kind of honor those, honor the champion, depending on, you know, whoever that might be. Uh, we always do great exhibits on, of course, the Heisman Trophy winner, but also the national champion. Uh, part of my job here at the Hall of Fame is to collect memorabilia artifacts from these historic games. Our team heads out to Indianapolis tomorrow. Uh, to work kind of the fan central area, but also get programs, hopefully, you know, get some of the memorabilia from the winning team, confetti, really just help share that story, you know, in Georgia and just for anyone who comes down to Atlanta to see, see the college football hall of fame. Oh, that's really cool. How long does it take to put an exhibit together? Um, I guess following this kind of game, you know, and once you've collected all that stuff, that's, that's an excellent question. It really depends on the teams and kind of what we're going for. So the game ends on Monday, Tuesday, I'm flying back, hopefully with some of the, the more novelty, the programs, the confetti, all that good stuff. And then usually it's me reaching back out to the teams almost right away as the games happen after the game or that Tuesday. And as the teams get back on their bus, my goal is always to have something up by maybe that Friday. Uh, so it's a real quick turnaround. Uh, after doing it a few years, you just kind of learn the ropes of what, what to expect and what might be needed or what you can really bring to share with people. And of one, one of the exciting things that can always be added, maybe, uh, you know, a key player from the game donates a helmet or the school sends over some of his memorabilia. And so it just really builds upon itself. Um, and it's one of those exciting things. It's not permanent which means you can always add to it as new, exciting artifacts come in. Yeah. Our team's usually pretty cooperative about that um, in terms of giving you access to stuff and, and sending things along. Yes, I think really most teams, almost all teams I've ever worked with are great about that. And I think it goes back to that being remembered, that legacy. Who doesn't want their, their Heisman Trophy winner or their national champion on display at uh, the mecca of college football, really? Um, it's just one of those things that schools are really excited to kind of pitch in and help where they can with, you know, things I might not personally be able to purchase or get a hold of while we're at the games. It's, it's great to talk to a team, a team manager, a sports information director, uh, really whoever that can help us get that memorabilia into our hands and then into the public view. All right. Well, hey, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be a busy weekend for you and everything. <laughs> Absolutely, man. I, I really appreciate it. It was, it was great. You know, I love sharing college football uh, history and uh, just talking about the upcoming game.